Ladies and gentlemen, I now take pride in inviting His Excellency Dr. to deliver his concluding remarks. Commander of the Army, Lieutenant General Dyer Atmaika, Chief of the Tri Forces, distinguished international delegates, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure, indeed, it's a great privilege to have been asked to deliver the concluding remarks in what has been, I think, an excellent and extremely informative Defense 14. I think the proceedings of the past three days have provided all of us with a really nuanced understanding of the challenges to Sri Lanka in the post-conflict era. But more importantly, I think it has also shown us the myriad of opportunities that exist for Sri Lanka and for our partners regionally in our ascendance. I think it's an enormous tribute to the Defense Secretary, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, for having conceptualized this defense seminar because I think it provides really an eminently suitable platform where can, we can have military personnel, civilians, academicians, and researchers all coming together, discussing the Sri Lankan model, sharing their thoughts, and having intellectual discourse and dialogue. And I think this defense seminar in its fourth year has really defined its place in international defense conferences. As you know, we in Sri Lanka, we have a rich 2,500 year history and heritage of a spiritual and cultural aesthetic of which we are justifiably proud. Our two greatest strengths are firstly, our people, and secondly, our geostrategic position. Throughout all the difficulties we've had over the last several thousand years, from the colonial legacy, to the world wars, to the 30-year conflict with the terrorists, and to the tsunami. What has really stood us through these difficult times has been the strength of our people. And I think it's an enormous tribute, particularly with the 28-year terrorist conflict, to the commitment the dedication, the resilience, and fortitude of our Sri Lankan forces who sacrificed their lives and their families in service to our country. All of you in the forces, in the Sri Lankan forces present here today, who have sacrificed so much for us, it is because of you that we are free. And we owe all of you an enormous debt of gratitude. We achieved that freedom in May 2009 under the leadership of His Excellency, President Mahindra Rajapaksa, and the pivotal role played by the Defense Secretary, Mr. Gotabia Rajapaksa. And in achieving that peace, we exercised the greatest human right, which is the right to life. Because since then, we have not had a single major terrorist incident, and all the people of Sri Lanka Tamil, Sinhalese, Muslim, Berger, Malay are free of the autocracy and hegemony of terrorism. Now, during this defense seminar, the keynote speaker, Dr. P.B. Jasundra, gave a really comprehensive and really quite a perspicacious analysis of the context of Sri Lanka, the history of Sri Lanka, from an economic, cultural, perspective and also spoke about our current macroeconomic environment and potential for the future. That was of course preceded by Lieutenant General Dyer Atmaika, the commander of the army, who in his welcome address focused on the balance between security, development and prosperity and also articulated the Sri Lankan model for defeating terrorism. 
Several speakers during this session articulated the very comprehensive reconciliation, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and reintegration program that has taken place since May 2009. 297,000 people were rescued in probably the world's greatest hostage rescue operation. And all those internally displaced people have now been found their homes. At the time of uh, May 2009, there were something like 1.5 million mines and unexploded ordinances, the majority of which have been cleared, leaving only an area of just 86 square kilometers. 12,600 LTT carders have been rehabilitated and every one of the 594 child soldiers have been returned to their families. The A9 was reopened, and there's a multi-million dollar program in the northern and eastern revival in terms of infrastructure development. The trilingual policy is being implemented island-wide, and everyone of all ethnicity, all of them are being uh, absorbed into the forces, the police force, and into the civilian um, uh, cadres. Most importantly, we've had northern provincial elections. And finally, after three decades, the people of the north have been able to exercise their suffrage. The um, Minister of External Affairs, Professor G.L. Pierce, in his address, gave a very comprehensive overview of the very pragmatic measures taken from a to achieve social and economic equity. And he also articulated very clearly the hi and highlighted the imperative of not internationalizing domestic issues. Mr. Lalit Viratunga, the Secretary to the President, traced the nexus between peace and development and the contribution of the LLRC towards building a positive peace. And he also spoke from a very human perspective about the social capital and trust, which goes beyond monetary value. The speakers on the first day, uh, the senior minister, Amanu Gama, as well as governor of the central bank, uh, Nivad Cabral, both spoke about the extremely conducive macroeconomic environment that we have today. We've had a 7%, over 7% year-on-year GDP growth rate. We have single mid-digit inflation, single-digit interest rates, we're narrowing the fiscal deficit. We have a historically high external reserves of over $9 billion. And the recent sovereign bond, which was issued at a relatively low coupon rate for frontier markets, 5.125%, was several times oversubscribed. And I think that's an independent and surrogate marker of confidence in the contemporary Sri Lankan narrative. But I think what's of real importance is the fact that our regional growth, as articulated by a lot of our speakers, our regional growth of, was over 25%, both in the north, the previously conflict-affected areas of the north and the east. And that demonstrates our commitment to build a truly pluralistic and inclusive society where everyone in the country can reap the dividends of peace. And that's very much in consonance with His Excellency Mahindra Rajpaksa's Mahindra Chintana policy of bridging the urban-rural divide and achieving a proper growth and a growth with equity. I think Professor Pires also articulated that it was the same theme that was chosen for the heads of government meeting, the Commonwealth heads of government meeting, which we were delighted to host last year. And the theme was growth with equity, inclusive development, to demonstrate that all of us particularly in developing countries and in post-conflict developing countries, should all reap those dividends of growth, not only for us, but also for other countries too, who have experienced the same. And His Excellency the President chaired the uh, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and has assumed chair in office of the Commonwealth, which is a sense of enormous pride to all of us. Because I remember that when a few years ago, when I commenced my tenure in London, there was a very strong, very well-funded lobby to try and move the site of Chogham away from Sri Lanka. And it was an enormously difficult task to change ingrained opinion. At the time, I was chairing the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Secretariat, which comprises over 50 Commonwealth High Commissioners. 
And, but I did realize that with persistent dialogue, with persistent articulation, with separation of fact from fiction, eventually the majority of Commonwealth countries understood that we all have similar histories. We all suffer from the legacy of colonization. And we all are at very different stages of development. And it is that depth and breadth of understanding that we need from everyone. And that is something that we should all move towards. And we were delighted that the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting were held in Sri Lanka, and rightfully so. Because many people don't know that we were one of the eight founder member nations of the Commonwealth, if you go back to the London Declaration of 1949. And in fact, we achieved universal suffrage 17 years prior to independence in 1931, and we had the world's first female prime minister. So we can also say a few things about gender parity and democracy to the world. And also, we have always subscribed to the twin pillars of democracy and development. We subscribe to the Singapore principles of 1971, the Harare principles of 1991, the Munyono Statement on Respect and Understanding, and the principles enshrined in the Commonwealth Charter. And the beauty of hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Sri Lanka was that it was a great index of confidence in Sri Lanka today. And it also enabled us to further strengthen bilateral relationships, particularly with other Commonwealth countries. And as Minister Perry said, they were very surprised and pleasantly surprised at the peace that is prevalent in Sri Lanka, at the positive peace that is prevalent in Sri Lanka, and also at the beauty of Colombo. And many people expressed this when we were here, and also they continue to articulate this when I'm back in London. And it, they all say it is so different from the very negative, anachronistic picture that is constantly being spread by those demagogues of division who simply fan the flames of hate well-funded, this very small rump of the diaspora. And I don't demonize the diaspora at all. I actually feel, that, I, I mean, I grew up there. I feel the majority, over 90, 95%, are perfectly decent, educated, sensible people. It is only a very small group of people who used terrorism as a business. It is they who are now out of a job. But they perpetuate it because they still have access to that funding. And that funding is now being legitimized into other businesses. And they are the people who continue to spread this very negative narrative and also continue to lobby even legislators and opinion leaders, think tanks, and certain aspects of the media. And I think that is something that is extremely, uh, is quite a challenge to address. I mentioned at the outset that our two greatest strengths were our people and also our geostrategic location. Because Sri Lanka lies exactly at the nexus of the maritime routes between the East and the West. And I think historically, in terms of our trade routes, that is probably why we're such a multi-ethnic, culturally diverse, and heterogeneous community. And in his speech, Major General Pereira also outlined the concept of the land force doctrine that transforms a component of the military from security-related duties to those of development and nation building. And he also outlined the very complex interplay and the multiplicity of actors, both domestic and international, in the post-conflict era. All three, Major General Pereira, uh, Rear Admiral Gunawadana, and Air Vice Marshal Jayampati, in their extremely clear and focused presentations, articulated the value of the geostrategic importance of Sri Lanka and the interplay between those great superpowers, the USA, India, and China in the Indian Ocean region. Because the Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean in the world and comprises 38 littoral states, 24 ocean territories, and 17 landlocked countries. And 50% of the world's containerized cargo and two-thirds of the world's oil region. So its sea lines of communication are critical globally for trade security 
and energy security. Overall, an even greater percentage of the world seaborne tr trade passes through these choke points, like the Straits of Hormuz and the Straits of Malacca and the Sunda Straits. So in a world of maritime politics, Sri Lanka, having achieved peace, has assumed enormous strategic significance and can play a key role globally and within the maritime silk route, particularly enhanced by the shift in economic power to Asia. From a US perspective, after 9-11 after and after the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, their port like Diego Garcia has assumed enormous strategic significance for them. And even after the withdrawal, trade and energy security will still demand enormous US interests in the Indian Ocean region and its choke points. If you look at Sri Lanka and its harbors, if you look at Trincomalee from the old days, it's the third natural, uh, largest natural harbor in the world, and I think Admiral Nelson said it was the finest natural harbor in the world. And Churchill said it was the most strategic. In fact, I think it housed the British Seventh Fleet during the World War. And when Singapore fell to the Japanese in 1942, it was of enormous strategic importance to Britain. And in fact, it, they used it to exercise some degree of control over their empire in India. In addition, I'm told that the depth of their inner harbor in the days of nuclear power and nuclear powered submarines actually is also enormous, of enormous strategic significance. And if you go to, uh, go to Britain, the, uh, separate from the Katisak and so on, uh, the oldest frigate belonging to Admiral Nelson, which is in water today but in a museum, is called HMS Trincomalee. And there's even an HMS Trincomalee fan club back there. And if you look at Hambantota today, it's just 10 to 12 nautical miles from the communication, the busiest shipping lane, where over 100 ships pass on a daily basis. And Hambantota has the potential to make Sri Lanka one of the preeminent shipping hubs and fulfill part of our five hub strategy. So also mentioned the aviation perspective and that we're just four hours away from the Far East. In fact, we're just four hours away, or probably three and a half to four hours away from Singapore, KL, Bangkok, Delhi, Qatar, and Dubai, Doha and Dubai. That is the value of Sri Lanka. So I think our speakers also emphasized, because of our geostrategic location, the importance of regional cooperation and regional integration and having a collaborative maritime and aviation diplomacy, harnessing our shared maritime domain expertise. That whoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia and again of the interplay between China, India, and the USA for primacy in the Indian Ocean. And in this context, Sri Lanka's geostrategic position is pivotal. In fact, I think it is the same geographic location that attracted our colonizers so many hundred years ago, when the Portuguese were trying to wrest control of the spice routes from the Venetians and Ottomans. They were the first to cross the Cape of Good Hope, and they colonized Sri Lanka in 1505. And then they were replaced by the might of the Dutch East India Company in 1656. And when the British were fighting the French in the Napoleonic Wars, they also took over the Dutch colonies and uh, colonized us from 1815 to 1948. I should also just touch on one of the factors that people often don't mention that lead to ethnic conflict in a lot of our countries, and that is the divide and rule policy that has always been carried out by colonizers. Many people talk about recent factors in the last century, but I think rather than being preached to from abroad, we ourselves need to be able to let people know that it is often the divide and rule policy of imperialist powers that sowed the seeds for a lot of the ethnic strife going on globally today. 
Because what they did in the divide and rule policy, we height, uh, they heightened differences. They put people together, they artificially compartmentalized people. And people actually lost their national identity. And subsequently, when we moved to independence, and the transition was usually very swift, when we moved to independence, we inherited economies which were struggling post-colonization with huge urban-rural economic divides. And we had that perennial search for a national identity, and that was compounded by the very nationalist assertion post-independence. And these, all these factors together, the divide and rule policy, the economic urban-rural divide post-colonization, the loss of a national identity were all ethnicized and politicized by successive generations. And those are some of the real factors that have led to the issues that a lot of our countries suffer from today. And I think the imperative, therefore, is to understand the context of the colonial legacy. And as we move on in the post-conflict era, to address the urban-rural economic divide, which we are addressing in to forge a common national identity which we are embarked on in order to unify all our people in the post-conflict era to be able to transcend the differences. If I could just touch on a few of the points specifically mentioned by our speakers. Uh, our spe uh, speaker from India, Dr. Subhachandran, also highlighted the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean region. He also spoke about uh, achieving a positive peace after the end of violence and the imperative of managing expectations. Our speaker from Pakistan, Ambassador Arif Ayub, he spoke about the clear shift of power towards Asia, the imperative of furthering regional cooperation, and the imperative of geoeconomics surpassing geopolitical rivalries. He also told us about the Sino-Pakistan cooperation in expansion of the Karakoram Highway, and involvement, therefore, of the new maritime Silk Road by linking Gwadar, uh, the port of Gwadar to the port of Karachi. Dr. Safi, the speaker of Afghanistan, also told us of their issues of being a, of strategic significance as a strategic hub. They've got a tremendous amount of mineral wealth and they're at the oil supply pipelines in Central Asia. She also spoke about the difficulties when domestic issues are, inter are internalized, uh, intentional, internationalized. In terms of our regional discussions, uh, Professor Bandoro of Indonesia spoke about the potential value and rationale for our engaging with SARC. And uh, Dr. Patrick Kugel gave an EU perspective and outlined EU concerns on human rights and the asymmetrical trade relationship uh, and their declining aid. He gave a few scenarios which were actually rather pessimistic, but Dr. Kugiel, in his last slide, gave a very, very interesting, uh, made some very interesting points about a potential alternative strategy. And I think that's something that really the EU should take heart of. What he said, and I quote from some of what was said in the last slide, it said, be modest. It said European states can show more modesty and understanding in their assessment of Sri Lanka's civil war. As, as its own experiences of interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, and Iraq have exposed them to the many challenges of counterterrorism. He said, be consistent. The EU should be ready to address the accusations of double standards and hypocrisy in foreign relations. And reassure its policy on Sri Lanka is not very different from its assessment of other conflicts. Be patient. Give us the time and the space as you have given any post-conflict country. Are we not deserving of that? And particularly in comparison to peer-reviewed countries, we've done substantially better than the majority of peer-reviewed countries who have suffered a conflict like this. Be open. Europe needs to continue their dialogue with Sri Lankan partners at every possible level. Be supportive. Offer more carrots and less sticks and support Sri Lankan-led and Sri Lankan-owned reconciliation processes, and be partners. Because we have the same aim of having a pluralistic and inclusive society with a sustainable peace. And I thought 
Actually, that was an excellent slide. Because if people adopt that, particularly those who seek to internationalize what is a domestic conflict and seek to abrogate our territorial integrity and our sovereignty, I think if people actually use that slide and put it into practice, a lot of their concerns would actually disappear. The, our colleague from Tanzania, Dr. Luoga, spoke again of the problems of the African subcontinent in the perennial search for identity. Only two countries of the entire African subcontinent have not been colonized, Liberia and Ethiopia. And he said so many are struggling. Also, Tanzania itself struggles with so many uh, issues of identity. And he said what kept them through was unity, their constant emphasis on unity and unifying all the different people. It also reminded me when we had our speaker from Africa about uh, the struggle against apartheid and Nelson Mandela. I remember when I was involved with the Commonwealth Society in my younger days, many years ago, also as a young activist campaigning, there used to be a flame outside the South African High Commission in London for every day Mandela was in prison. And all of us used to go as students and stand outside and have a vigil. And I remember joining that vigil. And when Mandela was released, uh, in 1990, and he first came to London, he gave his first press conference at our society. And what really struck me about Mandela was not that he was successful just to beat apartheid, but after 27 years in captivity, he forgave his captors. And I think he was really the personification of equanimity. And from the South African trauma and process came the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we had a very comprehensive Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, which really was based fundamentally on the TRC of South Africa. ILLRC, which many people criticized before it was launched. I, know, I used to get constant criticism. People said, oh, High Commissioner, this is going to be edited, or it's, not, it's going to be biased, it won't be critical, it will be a whitewash, constant criticism. But when it was published, and I remember it was published in December, I think 14th or 16th on a Friday, and I remember presenting it to British Parliament on the following Tuesday, people were absolutely astonished by it. It was not only released, but it was released in full and unedited. And it was a very comprehensive, impartial, critical report of over 380 pages. It was set within the principle of humanita international humanitarian law, incorporating the principle of distinction and the principle of proportionality. It had over 1,000 oral submissions and over 5,000 written submissions. And a substantial part of the LLRC is currently being implemented. I know there is more to be implemented, but if you compare our reconciliation process and the LLRC process, to many other countries who've had similar processes, we've actually done substantially better. And I think it is so important when people seek to criticize that they actually compare us, A, to themselves and their processes post-conflict, and also to our peer, -reviewed, uh, peer countries. And when people ask for accountability, the Commission was based on the principle of restorative justice, not punitive justice where people have forgiveness, and that encourages them to discuss the trauma of conflict, and it actually helps to heal the wounds of conflict. So I think that was enormously important, and we also have the National Human Rights Action Plan, which looks at implementation and monitoring of the LLRC. So we also had some other speakers who spoke about regional challenges, but before I go on to that, I must say that there was another excellent um, uh, exposition of the challenges that many of the Western countries are facing with the diaspora by uh, His Excellency, who very clearly articulated the challenges that even though terrorism may have finished, the physical war has finished here, but the international war still continues. And I think it's so important that we address it with the same focus, the same strategy that you all have done for the physical war. I think that is very important because
The war that is being fought, I said it previously in an interview, I said proxy propaganda war. But I chose my words very carefully. It is a war. I don't think it can be laughed off in terms of lack of communication or lack of marketing. It is literally a war because the funds used by the rump of the LTTE to procure arms, all those funds are now being diverted to fight this propaganda war. And I think it's important that we understand really the seriousness and gravity of that and the resources, therefore, and strategy that needs to be put in to combat it. Because it uses social media, There's enorm it uses an enormous network of international money laundering and um, financial transactions. And it's used, as I said earlier, really to prey on opinion leaders, sectors of the media, and many other people, and that actually influences people. It also influences people, particularly where there's a very narrow margin in terms of uh, votes, in terms of seats. So it actually appeals to the domestic electoral compulsions of certain countries. What it is down to, essentially, is votes and funds. And I think that is something we need to be aware of uh, when we do get some, some criticism from certain sectors. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, His Excellency Prasad Karivasam also highlighted the issues of the post-colonial legacy and very clearly articulated that very little of that was there in countries which have not undergone that process. We then went on to uh, our speakers from the Far East. Uh, we had a very interesting uh, discussion from Malaysia about their challenges in defining the state of Malaysia and their challenges with nation building. And the, he also mentioned Dr. Mahathir's look east policy. He took uh, Malaysia from a per capita income of 450 US dollars to $9,000 at the end of his tenure. And I remember he came down here, he was invited, I think, by SEMA during the conflict. And he was very pessimistic about the potential for Sri Lanka. He said, Sri Lanka will not survive because they don't have, they have neither peace nor political stability. So therefore, after the end of the conflict, we were involved with the Malaysia Business Club. We invited him back in 2010. And at that point, he was extremely positive. He said, Sri Lanka has the two essential ingredients that are necessary for its ascendance, peace and political stability. And what was also very interesting about uh, Dr. Mahathir, there were some very challenging questions, and I had the onerous and rather difficult task of chairing that session with about 400 corporates. Many of them asked, well, Dr. Mahathir, you know, you've been so anti, uh, is it that you're anti-capitalist? Uh, but how is it that you your development? Um, he said, actually, I'm not anti-capitalist. I take what's best from capitalism, which is appropriate for my country at that stage in its development, and reject the rest. I take what's best from socialism, which is appropriate for my country at that stage of its development, and reject the rest. I'm a pragmatist. But if at a later stage there's something else that's appropriate for my country at a later stage of development, I'll take that too. So he was very practical, and he didn't hold himself to any particular ideology. Another question that was asked was whether he was anti-American, and why was it that he had this constant battle? He said, actually, I was not against US. It was American foreign policy that was against me. And what I did was I created a very conducive macroeconomic business environment, attracted US business leaders. And when US business leaders tasted the fruits of that business environment, they changed US foreign policy on my behalf. So I think you see very interesting, very interesting uh, ideas from these uh, different people. We also had a very interesting uh, point about the governance and the four pillars of governance from our speaker from Singapore. And uh, also, she mentioned that um, about how impressed she was with Sri Lanka's progress in the post-conflict era. And we also had a very interesting discussion from our colleague from China. He highlighted, uh, well, he started off with uh, the travels of the monk and scholar Fa Zien so many centuries ago, and Zhong He, the admiral, and went on to the value of the Rubber Rice Pact of 1952, because at the time, Sri Lanka, again, was very brave 
because we had everything to lose at the time. China at the time was ostracized by the United States, but nonetheless, little Sri Lanka actually went ahead and signed that Bata Agreement, the Rubber Ice Pact. And subsequent to that, he spoke about how uh, we have tremendous, uh, 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 they have increased their cooperation and upped it uh, during His Excellency President Mahindra Rajpaksa's time from 2005, and also increased it to a different strategic level in 2013. Um, we also had a very, uh, in, our final, uh, in our final discussions on regional issues, we had, I think, a very brilliant articulation of India's current policy by Dr. Subramaniam Swami. Um, he was very clear that this was a distinctly new party under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And his intention that he, was, he, that he was committed to improve India's relations with Sri Lanka. And his intention was to harmonize national progress with spiritual advancement. I remember the time a few years ago, prior to my becoming High Commissioner, I had the enormous privilege of meeting Prime Minister Narendra Modi. At the time, he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, and we were accompanying a Commonwealth business delegation to Gujarat. And it was a very small roundtable meeting but during that time, after discussion with Prime Minister Modi, after listening to his razor-sharp focus on building a strong and resurgent India, I had no doubt that one day he would be the leader of India, and I had no doubt that he would maximize the true potential of the world's largest democracy. Dr. Swami also very clearly articulated that their foreign policy will be based entirely on national interests and not on narrow, regional, or local considerations. He very clearly articulated that the UN enforcement and pressure on Sri Lanka was unbalanced and intrusive and that they would not accept it. He very ar clearly articulated that the new pole and the center of the world was Asia and that they would not accept any group placing international interests above national interests. And finally, I think Asanga Abegunasekra also spoke to us again on the tremendous challenges of combating terrorism and security, particularly in the region, and the opportunities thereof for collaboration. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I return to the first point I made. I said initially that the strength of Sri Lanka is our people and our geostrategic location. The final point I'd like to make about our people, and also for lots of the countries who are present here today, most of us have a tremendous diversity of our people, of ethnic backgrounds and religions. And rather than fearing them, I think we should all realize that that is the true wealth of our country. The wealth of our country is the diversity of our people. And it is up to us, all of us, domestically and regionally, to leverage on that diversity. But in order to do that, we have to respect each other with our differences. Because I believe that it is when we respect each other's diversity that we give each other dignity. And when we give each other dignity, we will ensure a durable and long-lasting peace globally. So it is in that spirit, ladies and gentlemen, of respect and understanding that we are moving forward in Sri Lanka's ascendance, and also with an emphasis on forging a common national identity. I don't call myself Sinhalese or Tamil or Muslim or Berger. I am Sri Lankan. And I'm proud to be Sri Lankan. And that is my identity. And I think that this defense seminar, in addition to sharing expertise and experiences, has also certainly opened my eyes. And I'm sure it has given all of you an idea of the tremendous opportunities we have to collaborate and to be partners together. Because I think we, what is obvious is that we all share similar experiences. And I think this defense seminar has been enormously enriching. 
and also given us the opportunity and given us the ideas of how we can coll collaborate, both domestically and regionally. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that as people articulated, this is Asia's century. And we invite you all to join us in our endeavor of building and moving towards Sri Lanka's renaissance. I thank you.